My name's Stephen Bowers. I'm a South Australian-based visual artist. I live and work in Adelaide. And all the works that we'll see today in the exhibition here in Melbourne were made in Adelaide. I've been working for about 40 odd years, principally in ceramics, although I'm a visual artist. I do a lot of painting, drawing, design work, and my ceramic work is mostly known for its decoration, its painted surfaces. I've exhibited with Lorraine Diggins for well over uh, 20 years. It's always a pleasure to be working with Lorraine and showing in her gallery. The, I mean, one of the big differences between pottery and, and paintings and fine art in general, like paintings and drawings and prints, copper plate etchings and things like that, is you've, is you've really got the dialogue between fat art and flat art. And I work in fat art, so it's on the three-dimensional surface. And obviously, something goes on there because painting across a curved surface means that the, the painting is distorted. There's a lot of works where the design wraps around the form. And I play with that uh, distortion idea a lot. In the painting that I do, I compensate for the distortion. So what you see doesn't look all sort of you know, crazy mirror wall at a sideshow where it goes in and out, but it still has got a lot to do with the idea of reflection and being stretched over the shape because the, the decoration tends to wrap over the form. And the other thing is I use a lot of gold, real metal gold, fired onto the glaze to give you a mirror-like or polished a sheen background which reflects you. So as you're looking at it, the pot itself, in a way, so to speak, is looking back at you. The other thing, of course, of, uh, we're talking about painting, but what we're really doing is we're painting in ceramics. And so unlike you know, someone working on canvas or paper, once you finish the work, all you need to do is frame it. Whereas here, you have to fire it. And so it's taking your painting, your lovely fine detail painting, and putting it into a kiln under a, a glass powder which will melt and form a layer of glass but you fire it up to white hot temperature and as you fire it a lot of the very fine work gets burnt out. So really when you're looking at what I've done you're looking at probably about 90 to 95 percent of what I did because I've lost some to the kiln. That's the sacrifice of the potter what you must pay to the process. The chemical and the process and the heat work are, are what really, that's what transformed the median. And a lot of what I'm interested in is about the idea of transformation, sort of resilience and transformation. A lot of my work quotes from the past. It brings that forward and in some ways it parodies it, but it always transforms it, I hope. And some of it is familiar and you'll recognise it straight away. For instance, in my work, there's a constant refrain of uh, cockatoos and parrots. And that's principally me and my childhood. But for me, the cockatoos are magical birds. They are totemic birds, particularly the sulfur crested, sort of pugilistic. They're very big, they're very spectacular, extremely exotic. They're raucous. I mean, you can tell they descended from dinosaurs from the way they scream. The thing about the surface and the painting and using the reflection and the distortion, in this exhibition are a magnificent big that's me saying that, I hope other people agree. But there's a big pair of vases. If you look at them and then you just notice what I painted on one, I painted backwards in reverse on the other. So it's a mirror copy of its own self because of that playing on the idea of reflection again. I'm a potter, but I'm principally a decorator. And early on in my career, I, I, I was making everything. But I soon realised I was spending as much time making as decorating. I wanted to be a decorator, do the painting. So I began to work with other potters who were obsessed with making, with throwing, and would make hundreds of pieces, and, and that's what their production discipline was about. And I would be able to work with them and get blanks, which I could then quickly decorate. And I, in particular, worked with a chap in Adelaide. I still do. Mark Heidenreich is one of Australia's best large form throwers, if you want a pot big enough to put your whole family in and have dinner in there, and Mark can make the pots for you like that. And in this show, a lot of the big pieces, the big plates, uh, the really, you know, bravura pieces have been made by Mark. We sort of design, sketch them out, we talk about them, and then he, he's made them in his Terra Villa studio. The, the cup and saucer that we can see with the very, very large scale with which it's been made this is a classic piece of working with Mark. I wanted to play with the sense of scale here. We're sort of quoting from a traditional you know, cup and saucer. 
such a familiar object, but not at that scale. And the, one of the reasons we want to go into the, the idea of, of big made small and you know uh, little made big was because this pot in particular, this cup and saucer, uh, deals with the antipodes. It also is inhabited by Alice in Wonderland. Alice from Lewis Carroll's Alice in Wonderland through to Looking Glass. She appears very strongly on this pot. And anyone uh, coming up to it and walking around it will see a story sort of uh, in, in images of uh, Alice uh, dealing with issues of waste and uh, water scarcity. In one part of the pot she's depicted holding a rainwater tank in her hand while she's looking at an old bluestone Adelaide mansion and she's looking where to place the next water tank. And when you look at the Bluestone house, it's surrounded by tanks already. You know, people are worried about water in, in a dry continent. On the other side, she's wheeling out the Sulo bin, the, uh, the rubbish, council rubbish bin on the wheels. While she's listening, a good observer will see that she's listening to a Walkman. Alice, uh, as she's falling, she says, will she come out in Australia? She asks that question. So she's wondering whether she'll come through to the Antipodes. There's this kind of funny possible story of Alice in Australia, that she fell all the way through the earth and came out in Australia. There are little jokes hidden in sort of odd places within the works. But you're right, I mean, you, you, know, you flip this big cup over if you've got a couple of people strong enough to do that, and you know, underneath the handle there's a little your reserve and in there written in there in that tiny little inaccessible point is you know which is on the handle is get a grip you know like, there are all those little little puns and playful things about it all the the big cup and saucer th is is a is a unique piece in all the works here because this piece was made and fired in one go it's a quotation from blue willow pattern and it's basically a standard sort of spode or wedge wood or stoke on trent english copper plate transfer wear willow pattern classically been made since like the late 1700s early 1800s and is still in production today so it's had an enormously long run as a popular design but it's full of interesting sort of stylized references many of which go back to ming uh, originals chinese originals from hand painted uh, ceramics and there are strange sort of English versions of Indian Buddhist symbols that the Chinese use that then were copied and inverted and changed by the English and there are um, other works in this show where I'm quoting particular patterns from design history particularly uh, French toiles printed cottons of the Napoleonic era, a bit later, William Morris patterns. And there are also strong references to chintz, you know, these kind of popular strange export where the printed cottons that came out of a lot out of India, but there are also other sources for them. The new botany that was being discovered, particularly in the Asia Pacific area, as that got back to Europe, it was so exciting for scientists. But it was also the fashionistas who were after this and they turned it into marvellous sort of dresses and vests and brocaded uh, jackets and things like that. The dinner setting is something uh, very special for me to have here with Lorraine in this exhibition because uh, I've never actually attempted to have a full setting. I've had uh, one or two plates but this is actually covers the table. It's a setting for you know, four, five, six people and so that for me is a very special type of uh, experience for the audience because you normally would never see that. Here you're looking at a setting that's, that's each one is a portrait of a of particular Australian cockatoo or, or parrot. So there are all these little sort of slight quirky things uh, happening in those works. The other thing that's a theme in them of course is the background patterning because each of them is made up of these uh, reserves, these cartouches that are infilled with patterns and they, they really deal with three sort of sources and three ideas. One of them is the very strong Asiatic referencing. They are usable. You could, you, you could, you could serve a, you know, a red curry of kangaroo on one of those plates. I, I wouldn't really do it myself. I would dress the table with those plates and then when the uh, time came to have the dinner you would you would whip that plate away and have it, you know, a, a serving plate which can go in the dishwasher and do all the hard yakka.
in this exhibition there are several small pieces and these are the little ones that I made. There's more the scale that I work on, uh, a little you know, five or six inch bowl. I, as I say, I make them in my uh, carport. So, you know, just throwing on the wheel, lifting them off. Uh, and then I've decorated these up. And then in several of them, you'll see fragments of things. And in particular, this is, you'll see Ming Dynasty borders broken in fragments. So here you've got the Chinese borders, our borders with China being broken. And, uh, you know, border insecurity and border incursions are a big debate within Australia. This, in a way, is playing with that idea. It's a little bit of a parody in that area. Dogs are, again, statements of this kind of French-English con conflict. The dogs themselves be probably familiar to a lot of people because they are, are based on the classic sort of mantle dog, uh, which were developed in Staffordshire in England as a figurative sculptural object because it was very fashionable to have sculpture. They got into these very simple slip cast shapes and the dogs in particular took off and probably were in production for a hundred years. So these dogs, they take that form of the Staffordshire dog. They're hand built though. The Staffordshire originals were all made in their hundreds of thousands, if not millions, by a process known as slip casting. These are also known as flatbacks, so that on the back of the sculpture there wasn't much at all because they were to go up on a mantelpiece and they were to reflect the bright, shiny lead glaze and the gold, touches of enamel and gold were to reflect candlelight. But I'm playing again on the dogs with the idea of them as a contested territory over which the French and the English again square off with each other. Surfboards are like Mark's, uh, Mark Heidenreich's big pots, they're a big blank surface to work on. I did a collaboration with a very good friend of mine, uh, Peter Walker, and Peter and I worked together to create a board that he made and I decorated. And these are real surfboards. To me, they're canvases. When I'm given the board, it's this wonderful sort of flesh tone, it's very warm, it's not like the white of the pot. Uh, this has got a real flesh tone to it, quite warm, lovely uh, timber grain, and then I've painted over the top of that both the boards using this image from an engraving of the Stubbs painting of the first kangaroo that uh, travelled back with Cook and Banks. And that's the first sort of image of the kangaroo, the scientific image of the kangaroo. I use it a lot in my work because I, I, I quote from these sources. They mean something to me. I see them as symbols which are, uh, say something about the overlay of our cultural sort of expectations and uh, insecurities and, and, and how things arise and where their origins lie and how they might be transformed within our culture. And my work definitely draws on botany and zoology. It's got a mix of cultures, the human aspect, shall we say, but it really is sort of underpinned by the beauty of what I think is, lies in nature.